موبائلو Waalaikum assalam to Mubarak to you and everyone out there thank you so much for introducing me so today happens to be a fine morning in the capital of Pakistan Islamabad and moving on it happens to be geography awareness week it is an annual event that is celebrated during the third week of November each year the week aims to raise awareness about the significance of the geography environmental issues and spatial understanding and also encourage people to explore the world around them The event reminds us that geography is not just about the maps but also about understanding people, places and environment and it is really amazing that how all of these factors in your spatial environment affects your behavior and how do you want to delve into an understanding that and it's not just the science of the geography i would say it is an interdisciplinary field because it affects so many aspects of our life exactly and not just that i think in right. connection to this ladies and gentlemen we do know that it is all the uh, all of it is you know maybe the flora fauna humans everything Absolutely. on this planet or probably within the galaxies is by allah almighty True. and that one amazing gift that allah has bestowed upon us is hazrat muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam and while we are at it to learn about it we certainly yes. you know kind of revert back to quran sunnah ahadith or siratul nabi for that matter right. and when we speak of siratul nabi this is very Allah. important person that we really need to remember today because this happens to be today happens to be his death anniversary yes. so on november 22nd which marks the death anniversary of sayyid sulaiman nadwi an eminent historian biographer and scholar of islam coincidentally november 22nd also happens to be his date of birth His noted works include Sirat al-Nabi which he co-authored with Shibli Nomani and Khutbat al-Madras. He was graduate of Darul Uloom Nadwatul Ulama Lucknow. Aligarh Muslim University also conferred on him the honorary degree of Doctorate of Literature. His other major published works include Khayyam and Rahmat al-Alam, a children's book about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam. He founded Darul Musannifin and the first book published there was Ardul Quran. After partition Suleiman Nadwi moved to Pakistan where he was appointed chairman Talimat-e-Islami board. Right and that's wonderful. Raju. That's wonderful the amount of the work he has done and whenever a human passes away from this um very finite world into an infinite world what leaves behind is the legacy and the work and the amount that you carry forward mm. and in this regard um and obviously we want to now delve into another segment of our program which is a very interesting uh, segment because it talks about the ideas uh, the summit or the expo which was held in Karachi and it's a very huge event uh, which is uh, i think yearly being held in Pakistan and it focuses on the um the defense related aspects of it and it showcases what are the new innovation that Pakistan is doing so to further delve into this conversation we are very glad that we have been joined by ahmed ali who happens to be public relation officer pakistan ordnance factories assalam alaikum ahmed and thank you so much for joining us wa alaikum assalam and thank you for inviting me to your show right so can you provide us about the insights into this year's uh, the summit that or rather the expo that happened at the ideas in karachi yes of course basically i would like to tell you about pakistan ordnance factories and then i will move towards our ideas Uh, PUF is an essential uh, component of Pakistan defense sector and being the largest defense industrial complex we always participate in ideas every second year uh, when it's held uh, this time we have uh, come in with a product or diverse product range and we are launching approximately 10 products which include 76 mm smoke grenade and 125 APF STS anti tank ammunition while we are at it and while we are talking about the pakistan ordinance factories as well i think what we certainly would want to talk about is you know the participation of pakistan ordinance factories in ideas and to be very honest i think 
I would want to kind of uh, make sure that I state it out there that Pakistan's Air Force happens to be one of its kind as well, where we make aircrafts ourselves, you know, looking at how Pakistan Army has been doing it. Alhamdulillah, you know, it's like, it looks like now that it's like a one window solution as well. So how is it going so far and the participation aspect of Pakistan ordnance factories? Uh, so far, it's going good. This is a very big event for uh, defense production establishment. So uh, this year, Pakistan Ordnance Factories, uh, we have signed certain MOUs and contracts with uh, other uh, companies, and one of them is uh, to enhance production of 155 mm artillery ammunition with the Turkish company Rapcon, which will uh, uh, establish a state-of-the-art turnkey facility in Pakistan in the time frame of one year to enhance the production of 155 mm artillery ammunition and which will increase the defense of Pakistan as well. Exactly. And while we are at it, let's speak about the export aspect of it as well. How important do you think are defense productions, exports for Pakistan's economy and, and where are we at it? And what are the major markets that you are targeting? You see, uh, Pakistan Honors factories not only contribute to the defense sector, but we also contribute significantly towards economy. Like, uh, if, we, if we talk about the employment generation, we have 22,000 individuals working at Pakistan Honors factories, and uh, uh, we are exporting around uh, to around 40 countries around the world. These are friendly countries of Pakistan, uh, which also in return brings foreign uh, exchange. Uh, for us and then when if we talk about one other aspect we can see that it can also be a tool of good relationship with other friendly countries and it provides a good platform the for the purpose as well exactly right. and, and while we are at it can we please kind of uh attribute to the point that when we speak about the ideas expedition taking place in in karachi how many countries are participating what sort of you know defense equipment are we talking about over here the range of the defense equipment can you please shed more light on to that are we audible i, I think there is some sort of um, technical difficulties and we are figuring it out uh, but when we talk about the defense ideas when we talk about the this sort of exposition i think it's very very much important especially considering the fact that how not just um, contributes towards the research and development and the indigenous research and the development that goes within the country but also we need to talk about that how we can further explore other potential other potentialities out there especially in the emerging markets especially in the third world countries in the african countries because uh, defense is something which every country requires and it is something that is said in order to establish the peace you need to be prepared for the war right exactly and Ajay, in addition to this i think i still can remember i can recall it that you know when i was in my school that you know that they, yeah. they took us for a visit to the ordinance factories as well oh, interesting. where we ourselves saw how tanks were being made how right. artillery guns were being made and it was so right. amazing to look at all of those those things that you know that when we yeah. talk about the the defense economy it looks like as if that you know that we are not even behind anyone else as well you know the the guest is back with us you know so we'll continue with our conversation thank you so much for joining us once again and i do know for a fact yeah. that because of the ideas expo there's a lot of jammers in place so there might be a bit of difficulty but uh, thank you so much for joining us once again it's wonderful to have you Ahmed. you know back on screen so I'm going to come back to my point. How many countries are participating? Can you please uh, shed more light on the Ideas Expo currently taking place in Karachi? Yeah, uh, basically there are many countries uh, participating in Ideas, uh, for approximately 10 to 15 countries. Uh, uh, Saza, so when we talk about the Defence Expo and when we talk about the indigenous production, I think it's very, very essential that we support this industry and especially considering the fact that um, when we are talking about stabilisation of the economy, when we are talking about ba being backtracked, because Pakistan in 60s and 70s, there's generally this narrative that we have heard growing up. It was leading the third world countries. It was the leader of the third world countries and uh, first world countries used to look towards Pakistan whenever we talk about yeah. you know what sort of narrative that should come from and, the third and, world and Hajra, country, in right? addition to this there's one more thing that i would like yeah. to mention over here now imagine that if we are to kind of speak about you know us's economy you know so yeah. imagine that you know that all sorts of defense uh, production over there is private industry and Absolutely. unfortunately for them, whenever there is war in some part of the world, their economy actually goes up. Right, so right. And and I think we can discuss that <laughs> war machinery. But now let's go on to the Ahmed. Thank you so much, Ahmed, once again for being back. So now we were talking about, you know, what sort of target markets are you focusing on? And when we talk about the indigenous production and also exporting uh, that defense equipment to other countries, please go ahead.
Yes, at IDS, basically IDS provides a very uh, good platform for all the defense companies and organizations working around the globe. Uh, it provides a platform for commercial ventures, collaboration and technology share, sharing. Uh, certain innovations are also being uh, displayed here. So it provides an uh, extensive platform for all the defense protection organization and companies at IDRs. And it, uh, if I give you an example, that by, uh, we have recently signed a commercial venture, uh, which was uh, inaugurated by Secretary MODP, Lieutenant General uh, Jalal Hader, Hilal Imtiaz Military. Uh, this play, uh, this is a basically a flagship store of our subsidiary, Wine Industries Limited, named as Guns and More. And this is not only a flagship store, uh, but also it will provide as a business hub, or we can say a commercial hub for business activities, where we'll be displaying our products range, and all the domestic licensed holders of uh, NPB weapons can uh, go there and purchase the required weapons, ammunition, and hunting material as well. So ideas provides a very uh, huge platform for all the commercial ventures, for all the local companies and inter collaborations between local and international companies, with, which in return uh, is very beneficial for the defense sector of Pakistan and defense economy of Pakistan. Right. And Ahmed, when we talk about this indigenous production, obviously, then we are also speaking about the culture of the research and the development which accompanies that indigenous production. So what are some of the new research trends that you have found? And what are some of the new products that you displayed in this ideas which was not present uh, in the last year? And how much business have we garnered so far? So, uh, as you see, the global trends are changing day by day. So, Pakistan Ordnance Factory is also working on the capacity enhancement. And uh, in this regard, we have established new production deviants and some new commercial ventures we have also done. I, I, I recently uh, told you that 125 APF STS anti tech ammunition is uh, launched by our uh, uh, Pax PUF, and the uh, research and development department has worked on this. I would like to tell you that this is. Uh, this basically is of enhanced pen penetration and Pakistan is one of those five countries or who are making this kind of ammunition right now. All right. Uh, in addition to this, what role do you think ideas will play in strengthening international defense collaborations and the kind of business that we are looking at ideas 2024? Mm -hmm. Obviously, we would certainly want to pay rich tribute to Pakistan Army, Air Force, Pakistan Navy and all of those countries who've collaborated for this ideas as well but what impact do you think it will have at ideas almost all the defense protection companies and organizations have displayed their weapons equipments and other uh, materials so uh, international collaboration is being done uh, like for example we can see that drones have been displayed here uh, small weapons ammunition and other technical uh, techn technologies have been also been uh, present here so all the delegations coming from abroad visiting the uh, stalls at ideas they are doing some commercial ventures and collaborations partnership with all the local companies of pakistan which in return will obviously play a significant role in defense uh, sector of pakistan Oh, I think it's great. Right. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for being with us. Lovely to be in conversation with you. And certainly, you know, where credit is due, it's due. We certainly need to pay rich tribute to the government of Pakistan, not just that, the Pakistan Armed Forces, maybe Pakistan yes. Army, Pakistan Air Force, and Pakistan Navy. And, and I think that, you know, when we do speak about indigenous defense equipment production, I think Pakistan certainly is doing wonderfully well and that we have been on the right track and we certainly would want other institutions to be sustaining in that matter. Right and in a very interesting news development you know just wrapping up this segment and now moving on to another interesting aspect of our segment. So there was an art piece which shows a banana duct tape to <laughs> a wall and it was auctioned off to a whooping 6.2 million dollars at the Sudabais at the New York. The buyer was a cryptocurrency <laughs> entrepreneur Justice, and I think we can develop a same sort of collaboration, yeah, with the, with the hair. Nope. And the art piece yeah. was known as the Comedian by Italian artist Maurizio Catalan and made its debut at the Miami's Art Basel back in 2019 and drew such a large crowds that the exhibit had to be taken down for public safety and to protect their work on the display. I mean, who are the people, you know, who are spending so much money on just yeah. one kela and that is, you know, glued to the wall. Yeah, and, and, and you know what, you know, so as soon as it. I oh saw this God. picture and I saw this footage, you know, what came to my mind 
imagine that you know what came to my mind was that uh, you know the bananas that we get from the sunday market cannot make it till the next sunday <laughs> so what's the point of spending 6 million do- dollars and that too on a kela which will even probably next two days will will go rot you know so so who who are those people who are thinking about these ideas okay haja if and, you are and, doing and the auction started shazad from 8 lakh dollar and oh it went God. to 6.2 million dollar a banana the duct tape i can do this you know if there's people out there you know who who can who are willing to pay 1 million dollar even i can do it for a little cheaper as well so please make and sure and i can even bring the variety you know with tori <laughs> with kala kala and kala 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 and all of these vegetables yeah. uh, but in another interesting development says also what happened was that it was an extraordinary where the tallest women meet the youngest, youngest women yeah. it was an extra- the shortest yeah, yeah. yeah it was an extraordinary event when the world's tallest women meet the world's shortest women for the first time in london meeting took place at the occasion of the world guinness book of records day uh, rumesa gelji from the turkey who stands at 7 feet and 0.7 inches and joyoti amigi who is 2 feet and 0.2 or rather 0.7 inches bonded over, over a cup of tea both calling each other beautiful the pair have been honored as the world record icons in the 70th anniversary edition of the guinness world book of record wow. that's a very very interesting i mean i mean this is this is where you you know you say yeah. uh, subhanallah you know the, the creation of allah almighty alhamdulillah and with that ladies and gentlemen we're actually going to go head out towards yeah. a short break because you know with with all of this what happens is that imagine that we really need to kind of be thankful for the blessing that allah has bestowed upon Absolutely. us we really need to make sure that we look after our health we really need to make sure that we look after our peers that we strike balance and there's discipline in our life but unfortunately one of the uh, i think most uh, a lot of people who've actually kind of fell uh, prey to this illness is diabetes over here in our country it's Absolutely. on number 1 right now as of if we are to talk about mortality out of every 3 people one people uh, or one person is diabetic what should we do about this menace you know we've had the entire diabetes week we have had a lot of conversations but we certainly have never come down to a solution where we certainly did speak about that you know that we do not need vertical solutions but rather it needs to be horizontal so that all aspects of life can be managed under one roof we are very lucky that we've actually been joined by a diabetologist today and he will let us know whether what we need to do to make sure to number 1 avoid diabetes number 2 god forbid if you have type 1 or type 2 what do we need to do and then number 3 certainly if he's he he wants to give out a message i would want everybody to sit down with a paper and pen ladies and gentlemen we very lucky that we've been joined by dr shahid nadeem who happens to be a diabetologist hello sir assalam alaikum good morning how are you uh, wa alaikum assalam thank you for uh, the inviting thank you so me much sir for joining us wonderful to have you just let me know first things first do you take sugar in your coffee or tea and but no sometimes sometimes sometimes, sometimes, sometimes yeah, but I think that's uh, fine no. that's fine i think in the rich tapestry of the south asia there is a silent killer which is on the rise which is called diabetes sir and pakistan it ranks on the uh, top chart right so sir why do you think we are so susceptible to the silent killer uh you see uh, diabetes is uh, uh, growing rapidly uh, pakistan yeah, and uh, uh, according to diabetes international diabetes federation 27% uh, uh, people are uh, diabetic in pakistan in in but but in my experience the uh, the figure is much more worse than this okay. and uh, uh, the reasons behind this is uh, the number one top reason behind this uh, diabetes is obesity okay. and uh, inside obesity uh, there is a, a term known as uh, central obesity people in pakistan especially uh, men Uh, have their uh, waist circumstance uh, circumstance of about uh, yeah, more than thirty t- seven centimeters, and uh, um, women, most women uh, having yeah, their waist circumstance uh, of thirty uh, thirty you know, thirty two centimeters, <laughs> and uh, this is the uh, main factor, uh, the obesity and central obesity, the main reason. why uh, people but sir, why is it the main reason now imagine for a guy who's 63 you know if he's got a waist of 36 inches you know yeah. why do you do, what are we going to refer to him as somebody who's obese are we going to refer to him as somebody who's somewhere in the middle how what impact do you think will or what role will bmi play you know i think these are the things that we really need to keep in consideration no yes yes uh, definitely but you see when uh, in in pakistan everybody thinks uh, people talk to me Uh, that i'm not uh, i'm smart i'm I, i don't have fat on my shoulders but only my tummy is uh, going out yeah. and uh, uh, but when people 
do not uh, realize this type of uh, obesity, central obesity, uh, then uh, this is the main risk factor behind diabetes, hypertension, so many metabolic right. diseases. So, Dr. Saab, now um, please tell us, you know, why are we suffering from it? You talked about the obesity. Why do you think Pakistan is such an obese nation? Because there is so much poverty, staff poverty, and especially at the fringes, at the uh, periphery, yeah. but yet we are still ravaged by this. You see, um, uh, in Pakistan, people uh, are coming uh, towards a sedentary lifestyle. Okay. They, they, they stop uh, moving outside, they, they, they stop, uh, uh, you know, uh, going for, uh, uh, you know, any physical activity, joining gym, doing yeah. walk, any, but they like to work on mobile, mm. yeah. laptops and uh, gadgets. Not even work, spend yeah. time on mobile yes, and laptops, yes, yes. that's it. Yes, yes, uh, they, on, uh, even children. Even children, uh, you know, they are uh, spending so much time yeah, on uh, sitting on uh, mobiles and mm -hmm. uh, playing games mm -hmm. while our grounds are, are waking. Exa uh, uh, exactly, no and I ground. think that this culture really needs to come back because imagine that when me, Hajra, when we were going to school, first of all, we had bigger grounds, bigger schools as well. They were sports, uh, you know, mm -hmm. periods and whatnot. I think we need to bring back that culture. But if we are to kind of talk about somebody who's suffering from diabetes already, how long does it take to treat diabetes, number one? Number two, we see these videos on social media that diabetes is reversible. So please address both of these questions if it is possible. You see, you see diabetes is a, is, a, is a hormonal problem. It's a chronic disease. It's okay. not like a flu or uh, any infection which can be cured in weeks or two ti weeks right. time. Mm -hmm. It, uh, uh, you know, uh, any kind of diabetes, type one, mm -hmm. type two, gestational, any kind of diabetes, mm -hmm. it, you know, you see, it takes uh, uh, the combination of three things. There are three things which uh, uh, in combination can treat, uh, you know, diabetes, any kind of diabetes. Uh, good lifestyle, physically active lifestyle, mm -hmm. uh, diet, uh, good balanced diet, and number three is the uh, right dose of right medication. Mm -hmm. So, these are three things. Right. But uh, you see, uh, and it, it usually any kind of diet, it usually takes uh, a few weeks time to mm -hmm. treat any kind of, uh, mm -hmm. to control any kind of diabetes. Mm -hmm. But there is no 100% cure. Okay. We can control diabetes. but So, with type 1 and type 2, does it vary? Yes, de definitely, because type 1 is uh, that kind of diabetes in mm -hmm. which uh, your pancreas is not producing insulin. Okay. See, so, we need to give uh, so insulin, insulin to type yeah. 1 diabetes. That's different. While type 2 diabetes, the pathology mm -hmm. is different. In type 2 diabetes, sometimes insulin is, uh, is secreted in much more uh, quantity. All right. But it's not, uh, you know, uh, acting properly because of insulin resistance. Sometimes insulin is secreting, but the demand supply is there. But, right. It's not uh, fulfilling the demand of the right. body. And Dr. Saab, on the closing note, I would like to ask you, how do you define a good diet? Because I do feel that roti, which is a staple of South Asia, is something which is also contributing to this menace, if I am not wrong. You know. And all expert. Sahaba, all prophets used to eat the joki roti, you know, if, if uh, everybody you know, out there, yeah, you know, if you've actually read about the books and the sunnah as well, you know, you'll get to know about this as well. And, you know, towards the end, if you have um, any message for our audiences, please go ahead. Uh, yes, yes, you see, uh, uh, I'm practicing diabetes uh, for the last 25 years. But you and only look 25. You only look 25 <laughs> years old, Alhamdulillah. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, but in, 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 in 25 years, I, uh, there's uh, one, my, my one message for uh, diabetic patients. You see, any kind of diabetes, type 1, type 2, any kind of uncontrolled diabetes can be managed properly with a combination of three things. There is a formula. Yeah. There is a formula uh, in which there are three things. Good balanced diet, yeah. including roti, but whole grain. Okay, meetha ka, ka ki uh, uh, bulka, bulka. You can, you can, but so in, in, in certain, yeah. uh, in certain amount, okay. in certain quantity, but, sure. uh, but, uh, you not know, too much. Not, not too much. Right. And when you are uh, in hypos, when you are uh, controlling diabetes, then you can. Okay. But in uncontrolled diabetes, you cannot. Okay. If uh, this good diet, balanced diet, including roti, yep. meat, protein, fats, good fats, mm -hmm. and uh, active lifestyle. Okay. You should be, you know, uh, in ground for half an hour or 45 minutes for right. doing walk regularly on daily basis, right. Right. at least six days a week. Right. Okay. And uh, good medication with the, with the, with, with, with the, with the, you know, you remain in contact with the, uh, your doctor, your diabetologist.
regularly. Right. Exactly. And thank you so much, Dr. Saab, for coming here, for shedding the light on the diabetes and how we can manage to live with the diabetes because it is a pandemic that is very, very common True. in South Asia, particularly in Pakistan. And so now moving on to our next segment, which is very interesting and which is le uh, related to the technological developments. And one of the technological development is related to the artificial intelligence. So there's a lot of doomerism involved, gloom and doom involved that, you know, the, with the advent of the artificial intelligence, we are going to witness a world, a world which will be very much more scary because it is going to dominate our jobs. It is going to make a lot of people obsolete. But how can we exploit it for our advantage and how we can we show, make sure that it is contributing towards the humanity. So in order to discuss the real life application of the data analytics and artificial intelligence, because data is called the new dollar, the new currency, we are very glad that we have been joined by Muzna Malal. She is a data and the IT expert. Assalamu alaikum Muzna and thank you so much for joining us. Wa alaikum salam, uh, Juma Mubarak. Thank you for having me on the show. Mubarak Muzda, I have a very important question. First things first, and this is where I actually got a little scared as well. So imagine there's been so much conversation about artificial yeah. intelligence and it just popped up in my mind. Don't you think that artificial intelligence will itself learn more about how people are reacting to it and then kind of accommodate all of those emotions? Uh, there's a likelihood, yes, but will it be smart enough? I don't think so. I think at the end of the day, when you're building an AI model, it's being trained by someone in person. Someone's doing that backend coding. They're using the data that's already available. Uh, so I don't think they can be smart enough to beat themselves at the game uh, at the end of the day. Right. And Musta, so we have seen that there's a lot of development regarding the artificial intelligence. And when I talk about uh, in the introduction that there's a lot of doomerism which is found with the artificial intelligence. So how can we exploit it for the betterment of the humanity and rather than focusing on its very negative effects? Uh, wonderful. That's a great question. I think AI has been, uh, you know, there's a negative side to it, of course, but then we need to see the practical applications and a lot is being done, and especially in the last few years. Uh, we've seen a lot of great things but getting developed by the use of AI. One great example, and we had Dr. Shahid before uh, when he was talking about diabetes, in, is specifically in healthcare. Um, you know, a lot of image diagnosis, a lot of lab diagnosis, uh, image processing is being done through AI, which is helping us diagnose the diseases sooner than later. Um, you know, a lot of vaccines generation, a lot of drug drug discovery, which is like the vaccines that are being made for the for saving literally the humanity. So um, that's just one use case of AI that we're looking at. And, it, it, you know, it broadens to different fields, domains of, you know, financial data, operations data. There are different applications in terms of AI that are being used worldwide. But but Musna, obviously our discussion is incomplete without uh, delving into the doomerous aspect which has taken, I think, the global de debate by oh, the yeah. storm. And when we talk about the artificial intelligence, we do see that there is a particularly a trend in the Western world where a lot of people are going onto the YouTube, they are doing engaged in their content creation and they are earning a lot of money. So Google has created or YouTube has created a lot of jobs. So when we talk about the artificial intelligence, there is this aspect of the deep fakes, right? The, the deep fake audios and videos which are being circulated. Do you think in the days to come, we will, uh, uh, I mean, bring on the technology or humans are going to work on the technology which can counter the menace of the deep fake? I think AI, AI itself, do you think AI itself will be able to counter that? Absolutely. Uh, AI is already doing a lot of fraud deduction, uh, detection in terms of financials, you know, banks, financial institutions. They're already doing those kind of fraud detection, even in terms of YouTube, Google, uh, and the content that Hajra was just referring to. Um, you know, uh, they're building up the, the models that can train and that can find the content that's fake. Um, there's a, there was a big uptick. I know this content creation is fairly new in the last few years, uh, but there was a huge uptick on finding the fake uh, content on Twitter Twitter at one point of time because there were a lot of tweets that were not actually by the real people and bots. So there have been a lot of fake, uh, you know, content detection that has been going on in the past by AI and it continues to grow at YouTube, Google and big tech companies. Exactly. And in addition to this, you know, Hajra and me, we always speak about how AI in days to come might even take a lot of jobs away from a lot of people who still or probably are obsolete in the way that they work, unfortunately. Do you mm -hmm. think that that will be happening in days to come? Do you think that news anchors and newscasters or probably anchors like us will actually uh, be out of ideas because they'll be AI every single day, you know, entertaining people out there? 
I don't think, and specifically in your industry, not at all. I think uh, you cannot substitute creativity with an AI, um, no matter what. You need that human touch. You need that interaction. You need that feeling of being real, uh, that no matter how real you can try to make the AI be, it will still not be that real. It would have that human touch to it. Um, and of course, AI is replacing some jobs that are monotonous and it actually saves your time so that you can do other creative things. And I usually give an example that the AI can do some programming for you, but will it present that data to someone for you? Not really, not the way you can present it, not the way you can answer to the questions. Of course, uh, just like our communication, you're asking me a, a questions and I'm communicating back to you immediately. But with AI, there is some thought process. It needs some you know, data at the back end to evaluate and then make that answer or that suggestion. So there's always a time lag, no matter how advanced the technology gets, and it cannot be, it cannot have that human uh, touch to it. So I don't believe so. Um, yeah, our jobs will get. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely, I think a machine intelligence can never equal the human intelligence because human intelligence is something which is God gifted. Uh, Mosna, so now let's delve into another very interesting aspect since you also a uh, data analytic and data is labeled as the big data is labeled as the Gold. new, um, I would say, oil and it is the currency to survive mm -hmm. in this modern world. Um, but when we talk about the data analytics, how can um, we make sure that our younger population, especially Pakistan, has 60% of it, um, they can use this uh, uh, the newer oil to make sure that they are earning a good amount of the money and also we need to delve into its darker side and I think one of the biggest um, victim of the data analytics is the peace and the privacy so now how do you want to have this debate around these topics yeah I think you've raised great points and they go hand in hand because when we ask our students our young generation to work in data and AI field and build products and projects uh, and we're not giving them the right data. They're basically building anything on dummy data that's already available online freely, and it's not really real data. And honestly, when you graduate from an you know, online course and then you're actually working in the industry, that's when you see the real data. Um, so I think they go hand in hand. We want our young generation to be able to actually work on real-time projects, real-time data, um, and that for that, they can actually do collaborations um, through industrial experts. The, they can talk to supervisors outside uh, Pakistan as well. You know, it's a world of technology. You can connect through internet, uh, reach out, have proposals reviewed. Um, and then on the, the negative side, of it, which I felt is overall is lack of data being available in the systems. I know a lot of uh, students who had great ideas, but they, did, they, they didn't have enough time to collect the data. We don't have established systems. Uh, you know, there's no uh, data sharing. And even there's data sharing, there's no what we call as PHI, PI, which is personal information. So, you know, people have their personal information on their personal identifiable information that shouldn't be shared when you're doing this document. So we don't have those SOPs set, those standards set. You know, and uh, that will that takes a lot of time. So that's right, right, Musna. Because we are really, really short in time, we just have two minutes. So I would want to you to wrap up on this note. That how does the peace and the privacy aspect of this conversation develops? Do you think in the days to come, the humanity can converge on this global menace, or the capitalization or monetization aspect of it will always overweigh the ethics part? And the limitations of data and AI in Pakistan. Uh, so, the, so the limitations are definitely what I just spoke in terms of the system being available, no data sharing opportunities. So that's, uh, you know, the limitations that I see there. Um, in terms of the advantages, definitely they're huge. And um, there's a huge section recently that has uh, come to uh, consideration called responsible AI, which is people are actually in a position to make sure that the AI models that are being built are used responsibility, responsibly and they're not creating any bias. So I think the menace will definitely be taken care of in a couple of years. I know it's too recent, but there's a lot of advancement and um, AI has its advantages and it just helps us do our job, daily jobs much better and quicker and smarter. Right. Right, and thank you so much, Musna, for joining us and for talking on this very essential topic, which is developing. And in the days to come, we will see more debates, more nuanced approach, more multi-layer approach to this topic of the artificial intelligence and how it is taking the world by the storm. Until next time, it's a goodbye, Allah Hafiz, and good, good morning. Good morning, Jumbo Mubarak. Have a great day.